Thanks, Justin. Thanks for including me, and Bob uh, as well. Thanks for inviting me back. Uh, how many of you have done AIS cases as, as, uh, as part of your residency, been involved? So, uh, all right, not, not, not too bad. As, uh, as Justin said, it's not something that traditionally we see a lot of um, as neurosurgeons, which is a little bit, um, a little bit of a shame because they are nice cases, but also because the principles, uh, a lot of the principles of deformity surgery come from uh, the AIS uh, uh, patients and the work done um, going back historically. And, and AIS, in a lot of ways, is the archetypal deformity. So understanding some of the principles, picking levels, treating these patients, I think is useful in the adult world as well. So I'm going to run through uh, sort of my algorithm. It's a very general, uh, imperfect algorithm, but maybe to help give those of you who are less familiar with AIS a bit of an understanding, maybe hit on some, uh, some points um, uh, of value to everybody. So. Very brief, very simple uh, management algorithm for AIS, which is really a, uh, it, it's one of the few areas in neurosurgery where we're treating the x-ray almost um, as, as much as the patient. So first is to make the diagnosis. I also have a talk tomorrow where I'll cover a little bit more of the conceptual and uh, um, background information uh, sort of. So some of this I'll skip over fairly quickly. But making the diagnosis, assessing the risk of progression, and there are many ways to do that. I'll talk about a couple. Uh, determine the need for treatment and then choosing the treatment method and we'll spend some time hopefully maybe run through a couple of quick cases uh, at the end before we go to uh, go to lab. So the diagnosis um, algorithm that I put together fairly quickly looks something, uh, uh, looks something like this. So Question is, is there a coronal curve greater than 10 degrees? And if there's not, uh, that's scoliosis. That's something different than scoliosis, and, and that's the end of the discussion. That, those are the patients who get screened and sent to you um, for evaluation. Um, yeah, obviously, we aren't treating 10-degree curves, but that's the cutoff for, for scoliosis. Uh, patients with AIS are between eight, uh, 10 and 18 years of age. If they're outside of that, then you're either deal, dealing with a juvenile much of the treatment is very similar for those patients, although there can be some considerations about uh, intraspinal anomalies that uh, are, are more applicable to that group than to the AIS patients. And if they're over 18, then it's ad, uh, adult idiopathic scoliosis. Again, sometimes we treat them similarly, but there, there can be some differences, particularly if they're getting on um, uh, beyond their 20s and 30s. Um, and then, if we, then we get down to the area where it's important, especially as neurosurgeons, to uh, differentiate the AIS patient from the non-AIS deformity. Um, for example, if, there, if it's a left thoracic curve or a right thoracolumbar lumbar curve, as we'll talk about tomorrow, uh, that's against the typical pattern of an AIS patient. Those patients ought to be worked up um, uh, further with uh, MRI or at least further, further investigation to make sure that it's truly an idiopathic curve. Um, not all boys, this was meant to be a dashed line here, not all boys with uh, presumed AIS need to be imaged, uh, right? But only about 10% or so, uh, 10 or 11% of AIS uh, patients are, uh, are male. So you need to have a little bit of a higher index of suspicion for a boy with uh, scoliosis that there might be a cause for it rather than just an idiopathic curve. Is it an angular or atypical curve or is there a syndrome um, present, Marfan's or NF? Um, that uh, makes it a non-idiopathic curve. Are there signs of, neural, of a neural tube defect? And this is really where we need to bring our expertise. Is there a hairy patch indicating a diastem? Is there a leg, uh, leg asymmetry, uh, meaning leg length, calf uh, circumference, foot um, uh, asymmetry? Is there a, a dimple above the gluteal cleft? All of these things that uh, should lead to an evaluation of the spinal canal. And if, if you exclude these, I think I got the major ones here, then, uh, then we are talking about, uh, most likely talking about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And then the next step is to, to assess the risk of progression. And here, it's really an interaction between the size of the curve and the potential gro for growth of that, uh, of that child. Um, these curves tend to progress as the child grows, with the main period of risk being that adolescent uh, growth spurt. So these... Um, these, these data are from a, a paper that uh, I think Dan mentioned at the, uh, in his talk, the Lonstein Carlson paper from 1984, uh, but some uh, factors that can differentiate the low from the moderate from the high risk patient for progression. So smaller curves in a more uh, skeletally advanced uh, patient 
uh, RISR grade two to five. Um, I think again tomorrow I have the, uh, the slides showing sort of the RISR grade, but this is the progression of the ossification of the iliac apophysis. So this is a, a little bit higher grade, uh, grade five being skeletally mature, small curve, skeletally mature, lower risk. The highest risk, of course, is going to be the bigger curves and the, uh, and the less mature. We also ask questions about uh, menstrual histories in, in girls, family histories, growth spurt. We chart the growth of these patients, trying to assess the, uh, the potential for progression in that child. There is something, a, a genetic test, that um, I'm not sure exactly where the uh, um, pendulum has swung on this. The Scoli score was being used pretty widespread. Um, at least at our institution, we've backed off a little bit, um, finding that A, the expense isn't covered by insurance companies, and B, it may not be much better than uh, these criteria in terms of differentiating low from moderate from high-risk patients. So um, you're going to tend to treat the higher risk patient and the lower risk patient for progression, of course. But then there are other considerations for for treatment, and these are all relative, right? These are not absolute. And every patient, with every patient, there's a conversation, and particularly with the parents as well. So. So if you have identified a patient who has a, a real AIS and is, is meeting these thresholds really sort of over 20, 25 degrees, when we start to talk about, uh, about management of some sort, we divide this then into operative and non-operative treatment. And so non-operative treatment, at least in uh, the Northeast, uh, Cobb angles less than 35, 40 degrees generally we treat non-operatively. I think that that threshold is, is different in different places um, uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, we rarely treat anything uh, less than 40, 45 uh, degrees uh, in, in New York. Um, the skeletally the immature patient, uh, the patient who we can sort of guide their growth. So the more immature the patient is um, uh, with a uh, reasonable curve, we're going to try to brace those patients in general. Body habitus is a factor, of course. And then uh, 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 bracing is going to be better and better tolerating of a better outcome for the patient who has an acceptable clinical deformity compared to the patient who presents with a main complaint of uh, the clinical deformity um, and that we can really only correct with operative treatment. Bracing is really to hold the curve, not to correct it. Operative treatment um, is the way to correct a clinical deformity as well as the, uh, the radiographic deformity. So, in surgical treatment, the, uh, the, the key, so moving ahead then, in, in surgical treatment, we need to determine which curves are we going to instrument and fuse. Uh, and the principle here is to correct and fuse the structural curves while not fusing the flexible, non-structural, or compensatory curves. Uh, and then as part of that, we need to uh, determine the UIV and the LIV. How, what's our construct going to be? Where are we going to, uh, to instrument from and to? This first part is really the, where the Lenke classification comes in, um, and, uh, and that rests first on a, uh, on a thorough radiographic evaluation, as we've, uh, as we've talked about. Certainly long cassette films, upright AP or PA films, and an upright lateral uh, where we see from ideally base the occiput to the, uh, to the hips. Um, but with, uh, with kids, particularly when we're planning surgery, we then go ahead and get uh, some flexibility films. We get right benders and left benders, and that's to look at the flexibility of the various curves. And then generally, we also get another, uh, another flexibility film, which I didn't show here, uh, of some sort. I use a push prone film, lie the patient down, put on a lead glove uh, and a lead apron, and push on the apex of the curve while stabilizing the, uh, the shoulder or the hip to see, um, see sort of what's, what's the maximal extent of active correction I can get for that patient. And that just gives the best sense, I think, in combination, of course, with the benders of how flexible that curve is and how much we may be able to correct um, the uh, curve. We've talked about uh, some of this uh, already, but uh, for the Lenke classification, the apex, uh, we need to be able to identify the apex of the curve. Usually we can identify that as a maximally displaced or horizontal segment. 
cob levels are the maximally le uh, levels that are tilted maximally into the curve. Sometimes this gives uh, people starting out looking at deformity a little bit of trouble. Sometimes it's easiest just to take your goniometer and start, uh, you know, above where the curve is. Yeah, if you're if you're trying to measure the cob angles here, start with your goniometer up above. Find the first level where you're sort of maximally tilted into that curve and follow that through. And so in this case, right, this level here, T10 is bending up into the next curve. So T11 is the proximal cob level. Uh, and then L3 is the distal cob level on this example. And it's important when you're tracking progression to measure the same levels from one, one film to the next. The neutral vertebra is the non-rotated uh, segment. Look at the pedicle symmetry to identify that. And the stable vertebra is the one that's closest to being bisected by the uh, central sacral vertical line. So we put those pieces together to, uh, to then uh, classify a curve based on the Lenke, the Lenke system, which is shown here. And sometimes this is a little bit daunting, I think, uh, starting out. I know it was for me uh, in my fellowship. So let me just very quickly walk through sort of the order that I uh, attack this. The first thing to do is identify right, which curves uh, are which uh, based on the SRS definitions of the location of the apex, so thoracic, thoracolumbar, lumbar, and then uh, a proximal thoracic uh, up, up above the uh, uh, T2. The structural criteria uh, for the minor curve. So the major curve, the biggest curve, is always structural. So there's no issue there. So then it's a matter of determining which of the minor curves, the smaller magnitude curves, are structural and need to be included in the instrumented construct. And here are the criteria. Again, it's worth uh, uh, reading this and, and having this. But basically, if these bend out on the uh, coronal films to less than 25 degrees, they're non-structural. So anything that doesn't bend out to less than 25 degrees is, is structural or a kyphosis of greater than 20 degrees on the lateral film is a structural curve. That was really the contribution, one of the main contributions of this, of this system, which wasn't just the work of Larry, but uh, uh, several other investigators, um, was, I, I was adding in the sagittal plane uh, considerations, which were not part uh, of, the, uh, of the King system. So with that, identifying the structural curves um, and, the, uh, and, and of the various curves based on their apices, we then can uh, type the, uh, the scoliosis. And this is simply, these six subtypes are simply based on which curves are structural and which are non-structural. Uh, and then they all have a, a name that relates back to the, again, back to the sort of the king system, main thoracic, double thoracic, double major, et, et cetera, but trying to uh, increase the inter-observer uh, reliability of the study by having these structural criteria. Finally, there are two modifiers. One is the lumbar apical modifier, and that's really looking at where the CSVL falls relative to the apex of the lumbar curve. There's an A, B, and C based on uh, whether that uh, CSVL is between the pedicles, at the pedicles, or lateral body, uh, or uh, completely medial to the lumbar uh, curve apex. Uh, and then there's a sagittal profile modifier based on the kyphosis uh, of T5 to T12. So how do you pick levels? Um, well, first you pick curves. The major and the structural minor curves are included in the construct in general. Again, beware the rule maker, but these are some pretty, uh, uh, pretty consistent generalities. And we exclude the non-structural minor curves. We're trying to save uh, levels. And so therefore, the classification helps us determine which curves should be included, but it doesn't tell us specific levels, um, proximally and distally, uh, or the extent of, uh, of a curve that's, that's to be instrumented. And this is where judgment uh, comes in. So looking at this curve uh, uh, quickly, so here, or this scoliosis quickly, uh, here we have a, uh, a uh, lumbar curve, thoracolumbar lumbar, uh, and a thoracic curve. The proximal thoracic curve really here doesn't warrant uh, uh, too much in the way of considerations. We can identify the apices, the magnitudes. This is 36, this is 43, so our major structural curve. So now the question is, is this, is the, the main thoracic curve, is that structural? We look at the right bender, for this film, right? That's the one that should straighten that out, and it does. It's below 25 degrees. It bends out to 18. So that's a non-structural uh, minor compensatory curve and doesn't need to be included in, in, a, in a construct. Um, and so we put this together. This is a 5C. 
Okay, it's five because it's, uh, it's simply a thoracolumbar lumbar curve with a non-structural main thoracic curve. Basically, all fives are going to be type C. You can think about why that is uh, relative to the uh, uh, CSVL. Um, and then we look at the sagittal plane, uh, and there's 18 degrees of kyphosis, so that's normal, so this is a 5CN. Okay? But it's all about balance with levels, balancing uh, uh, cob levels, or balancing avoiding progression or adding on the curve versus preserving motion segments. If you just wanted to avoid progression or adding on uh, segments to the curve post-operatively, I'm talking about, you could you'd fuse cob at least the cob levels of the structural curves, maybe a little bit more. On the other hand, if you wanted to preserve motion segments, you would err on the side of selective fusion, fusion fusing as few of the curves as possible. Uh, but these are the considerations, uh, among others, that we try to balance um, in, uh, in level selections. Other things that we look at, we look at the shoulder balance. That's a, a topic in and of itself, how the, the shoulder tilt uh, manifests itself, and also, uh, given the flexibility of a curve and how much we may be able to correct a curve, what that's going to do to the shoulder balance. Um, and finally, we, based on the flexibility um, of those um, uh, bending films and the push prone, what the post-correction position of the LIV is going to be, how well we're going to be able to center that, that lowest uh, instrumented vertebrae. You don't want to fuse uh, to a level that's way off, uh, off to the side uh, necessarily or has significant tilt or residual rotation. That puts the uh, subjacent level at significant risk for degeneration and, and adding on. So a real quick run through, confirming the diagnosis, assessing the risk of progression, determining the need for treatment, and, uh, and selecting uh, the treatment. I pulled a couple of cases. I just, let me walk through, let's walk through two. We can do that in probably about three minutes. Um, uh, sort of how this looks um, in, in real time. So a 14 year old, 46 degree proximal thoracic, 81 degree thoracic, and a 30 degree lumbar curve. Uh, if there's any uh, doubt about why this patient might need to be treated, I think this probably puts that to rest. A significant trunk shift, uh, um, waistline asymmetry, uh, and posterior uh, rib hump here. Here's the radiographic evaluation. So we look at the left bender to see how the left curves um, uh, bend out and the proximal thoracic. Is that structural or non-structural? So that's structural. Okay, we look distally, right? We're gonna skip this for the moment. We look distally, this thoracolumbar lumbar curve, structural or non-structural? So that's non-structural. This is our major curve, so is that structural or non-structural? So that's gonna be structural. So we have a structural PT, a structural MT uh, uh, curve. So that's gonna be a double thoracic, right, type two. Uh, there's 20 degrees of kyphosis, so that's normal. Uh, and the, uh, the apex of the uh, lumbar curve is, uh, is, is basically the uh, CSVL is between the pedicles, so it's at 2AN. So we're going to fuse, the, we're gonna fuse the, uh, the proximal thoracic and the main thoracic curve here. And then it's a matter of picking, uh, picking levels. Um, but uh, basically we look at uh, trying to get a level that's distally neutral and stable if possible, in this case L1. Proximally, we need to get shoulder control. Again, that's a, a, a little bit of a, um, uh, maybe a more advanced topic, looking at the fact that the shoulders are level and how we have to control this. But getting up to T2 or T3 to maintain shoulder control and address the proximal thoracic curve. And that's how we walk, would walk through that. Um, and there's the post-op uh, films. Last one for illustration. So here are the measurements, 40, 87. Uh, and 84, so we're really going to look at uh, particularly this proximal thoracic curve uh, for flexibility. It bends down to 37. Distally, no surprise, that stays above 25. So these are all uh, structural curves. Um, we also have a thoracolumbar kyphosis, uh, and I believe, I can't see it from here, I don't have my glasses on, but uh, uh, a, a positive uh, kyphosis, so it's a 4C, right, triple major. Um, and so all of these have to be instrumented, and it's a matter of then experience deciding, can we stop at four at the cob level? Can we stop a little shorter? Do we need to go longer? How many levels can we save distally? Um, but uh, instrumenting all three uh, structural curves uh, in, this, in this case. 
Let me end there. Any questions? <laughs>